add to what, what I left with you last time when we were talking about strengths. Um, I just want to affirm Mary and, and what she said, everything she said is fabulous. And, and here's the thing. Um, she talked about adventure. Life really is an adventure. It's exciting. <coughs> don't ever, whatever you do, don't settle for less than what God has for you. And yet, at, at this point in your life, you're looking at a big unknown. What does it look like? Um, how am I going to get where it is that God wants me to go? And I promise you, here's the thing. Um, God's got his plan. He knows what it is. You've got to be willing to get in there and do the work and pay your dues. I paid dues for a lot of years. And I teach a class now called the Master's Program. And it was designed to go to those guys that are 50-something that have made a gajillion dollars and they've got all the success in the world and all the money and all the fame and all that they were looking for and yet they said, there's got to be more than this. And the master's program was created for those guys to take them from success to significance. It's a three-year program that helps them find their kingdom calling. Okay, it's fine that you've lived your life up to this point in the world. Now what are you going to do that has some eternal impact? Well, if you start now thinking internally, thinking in terms of, I am put on this earth to change the world, what might happen? Do you think your focus might be a little different when you get that far down the road? By the time you get to 50, you will have changed the world. I started this process myself when I was 52 years old, 10 years ago. If you had told me 10 years ago I'd be doing the things that I'm doing now, I wouldn't have believed you. But that was the point that I really started my adventure. It doesn't mean that the first 50 years were a waste. They weren't. They were all built up to this. But it, it brought me to a place now where every day is exciting. I can't wait to see what's next. And honestly, I don't know what's next either. I can tell you what I do and what I love, but where God's going to put that to play over the next 30 years, I have no clue. But I want to be like Moses. When I go out, I want to be able to go out swinging. I don't want to go out full of vigor. That's what the Lord says about Moses. He, the Lord took him out at 120 years old, and he was full on when he took him out. That's the way I want to go, too. And by the way, the whole idea of retirement, forget it. That's a bad idea. We're not made for it. We're made to work. Okay. Last time we talked about strengths, and we talked about genius, and we talked about that I am made for something unique and special, and she talked about specialization, and you are special, so be special. Never be mediocre, never accept a job that you're not excited about, never do something that you can't be completely plugged in, passionate, turned on, and ready to go do. Why? Because there's too many people doing that, and you see them everywhere you go. Don't be one of those people. All right, what have I got here? What I've got here is a series of different roles that you can look at and identify. How do I best fit in this whole big world? Because there's lots of opportunity and they're all around me. And how do I know where I best fit? So I started with what I've got at the top of the page called the development timeline of an organization. Mary experienced it because she was the originator. She came up with the idea. Somebody says, why don't you make candles out of those baby jars? And she said, well, OK. So she went in the back and she and her friends started making candles and they sold these candles. And the next thing you know, she's got a multinational company making millions and millions of candles. Wow, who knew? Who knew indeed? Less than 10 years. That's crazy. No, almost 20 years. But still, I'm, I'm a little bit behind. Um, imagine what God could do. Well, God can do anything he wants to do. And he's got this... And he wants us to be excited about it. He said, I came that you have life and have it to the fullest. So don't accept anything less than that. Well, in this developmental timeline, you've got the original beginnings in the back room of a warehouse that's empty making candles. And then you've got to build a factory and get organized and, and build an infrastructure. And at some point, everything's humming along pretty well. I'll tell you how the fire when your plant burns down. But the point is, at some point, you've got what, what's called an institution. Everything's running. Everybody's in their place, doing the things that they're doing, driving the business. She's still making deals and out there and leading the charge and building and growing the business. But her role has changed significantly when she, from when she was first starting to make candles in the back room of that warehouse. She's the originator. And then you come along in the, later in the timeline of the business and you've got the organizer. And the organizer is the guy who takes the idea and starts to flesh it out and put it into a, a plan. And when he gets the plan in place and it's up and running and things are going pretty smoothly, he turns it over to an operator. 
So one question would be, where would I best fit? Would I best fit as an originator, an organizer, or an operator? Nothing good, bad, or different about any of those. They're just different roles. You need to understand which one you fit best in. In my case, I am that hybrid. I'm the originator slash organizer. I take a good idea, but I'm going to make it better. And then I'm going to make sure it works, and then I'm going to pass it on to the next guy. But that way, I've always got things going. I'm always looking for ways to do things better. One of my strengths is a learner. So I never am not learning something. I love TED Talks, too. I can't wait to hear that one. I haven't heard that one. I don't know how it. So learning, growing, expanding, looking for that next idea. Who can I influence? How can I change the world? You're going to change the world by the things that you do. You're going to change the world by the influence that you have on other people. That's, that's called leverage. And that's what we do. Does that make sense? OK. Well, then this concept came to me just in the, in the last month. And it was straight out of Ephesians chapter 4, and where Paul was describing the different kinds of leaders in the church. And you've got apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of saints, to prepare the saints for the work of service. And in case you wondered, the staff-led church model is not the way God had it intended at all. And too many churches look more like a cruise ship than they do like, a, like an aircraft carrier. And what they should look like is an aircraft carrier. Preparing the saints, that's us, to be launched out to the world, to change the world. We're the tip of the spear. We're the only weapon God's, God's got to change this world and to take back the kingdom. So if you think about why am I here, what did Jesus ask us to pray? He said, pray this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is that your prayer? Do you want God's kingdom to come? Too many of us think that that's somebody else's job. Well, that's God's job. No, that's our job. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? In me. And I promise you, when you start to see how God is going to use you to build his kingdom, you're going to get on a journey that won't stop and it'll be so exciting and thrilling. You wonder how everybody can get on with this. So apostles. What is an apostle? Apostle is really kind of the originator, the CEO, the one who came up with the idea, the one who leads the charge. And what I'm doing here is taking a biblical principle and applying it to the marketplace. Because guess what? Biblical principles work in the marketplace. And Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great. Every bit of that comes straight out of the Bible. In fact, every good idea comes straight out of the Bible because it's all in there. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. There is nothing. I've never had an original idea in my life. This sheet of paper, guess what? Nobody that I know of has ever put all that stuff together at the same time. So you're getting it first. How cool is that? But none of it was original with me. Well, the combination is the one you need. And it's really good stuff. All right. The prophet. The prophet's the protector of the brand. So the prophet's the one who makes sure that the message of the company is getting out, that it's consistent, and that it protects the brand. You have a personal brand. You need to be sure you protect that personal brand. And then that stands for something worthwhile. Things like honesty, integrity, hard work, diligence, excellence. Whatever you do, do it, <coughs> but do it excellently. And if you can't do it excellently, get better at it until you can, or don't do it at all. Excellence is so lacking in the world today. And yet when somebody does something excellently, like make candles, guess what? They take over the world. It's no secret, it's no accident that Walmart dominates retail in so many ways. Why? Because they do things excellently. They're amazing. But the evangelist, pretty simple, he's the sales and marketing guy. He's the one that's out there selling the product. The pastor. Mary's got some pastor in her, too. You could hear it when she talks about the concern and care that she's got for her, for her employees. And the one thing in her heart is that she wishes she had more contact and had more ability to, to interact with them. And I promise you, when she goes into those plants, she makes sure she gets to meet those people. And she looks them in the eye and she talks to them. And, and they immediately get it. She cares. That's the pastor. It's also the HR department. It's the benefits. It's the ones who are there coming alongside employees. Imagine, and, and I hear this all the time about people who work for companies where you're just a number and nobody cares about you. Hmm. It's painful. It really is painful. And businesses that miss this, miss an opportunity to build a team and, and, a, and a sense of belonging and, and 
Continuity and connectedness that if it's lacking, it will, your, your business will suffer as a result of it. And then the teacher trainer, obviously, is another role that's critical to the success of a business. You've got to be able to train people. They have to gain the knowledge that they need to do their job well. So underneath that, if you look at what you've got on the sheet, and I, can't, I don't have any time to go into a lot of the details, but you can pretty well make the connections between the strengths, which is at the bottom of the page, if you didn't recognize that. At the bottom of the page are strengths, a list of strengths from strength finders. Go back and pull your book out. And look and see what your strengths are. Where do they line up? I was asked a great question in the first class. Well, what if my strengths aren't all in one category? Well, they won't be. But it's going to, and, and here's another thing. At different times in the different lives of different organizations, you may be on a committee and you may, may need to be the apostle on that committee, even though your heart might be somewhere else. I mean, roles need to be filled no matter how small the organization or the entity is. Those roles still need to be there. And if all those roles are in place and they're operating, then that organization has a much greater chance of success. And so you may have to fulfill different roles in, in different organizations that you serve. Um, and your different strengths will come to the fore during that period of time. Any thoughts or questions? So well, it's all right there. In blue or white? <laughs> Which one do you think you are? Oh, I know what I am. I'm a full on profit. And, 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 you know, it gets me in a lot of trouble because prophets aren't welcome. Because prophets are truth tellers. And so telling people the truth is not always what they want to hear and they don't always like it. And yet it's something that's necessary. And so if you, if you look, even these five things at the top really do kind of line up pretty, pretty well with those roles. And profit comes right under originator organizer. So that's kind of where I fit. Um, the thing about strengths, is that I don't really worry so much about the strengths that I don't have. Empathy and mercy just really aren't there. I don't, I don't agonize over that. Why? Because God's got people with empathy and mercy out there doing what they need to do. And that's a good thing. That's not my role. It doesn't mean I don't care about people. Of course I care about people. But I care about people in a different way. As a maximizer, I can't stand the thought of you not becoming fully everything I made you to be. That just drives me nuts. I will, that's what I want for everybody. Right? Does that make sense? Well, somebody who's empathetic and merciful is going to say, it's okay, you know, you're going to be fine. You know, God loves you. It's, it's all going to be good, so don't worry about it. I know you're troubled right now. It's okay. It's good. We'll get through it. Well, okay. I'll say, get over it. <laughs> Same message, different, different delivery. Else. A question. How, I'm sorry. How yeah. open are um, how open are you in, in your company with religion? So there's certain companies, Hobby Lobby, for example, um, <coughs> very open about you know the, the faith-based business. Mm -hmm. How open are, are you guys in that capacity? I mean, I know Happy's is open, you know, pretty much seven days a week, yep. um, and so on. That's that's market driven. That's understandable. Um, but, See where I'm asking? Sure, absolutely. So it's a great question. Um, first of all, the First Amendment protects my right to speak of what I what I know. I'm not out proselytizing people, but there's nobody that works for me that doesn't know exactly where I stand and where I'm coming from. Fortunately for me, most of my managers, my direct reports, are strong believers, and that's a great joy and delight for me to be able to walk into a business and, and speak to them at a, at a much deeper level. Some aren't, and I don't even bring it up, but I still use the principles upon which I stand to drive what I do. If I have the opportunity to speak into somebody's life, I'll take it. When I have an opportunity to send a sympathy card, I always mention God in it, and I always tell them I'm praying for them. I don't say my thoughts and prayers are with you. It's my prayers are with you. And may the God of all comfort comfort you in all of your afflictions in order that you may then comfort those who are likewise afflicted. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I do, and I do it unashamedly and unabashedly, and I'm free to do it. And fortunately, my company has a uh fault with it. Um, so, but as a, as a uh, First Amendment, citizen of the United States, I have every right to speak now. Um, that, that's not always recognized in a lot of businesses think that there's just some separation of church and state. I'm not trying to convert people, but I am trying to love them and show them what Christ loves them. Like. 
I think it's excellent. I just I just remember the days when I was in the military. We had a commander that had a Bible on his desk. He was pretty much told you have to take the Bible off his desk, and he kind of thought him on it a little bit, but then eventually had to take it off. Which I thought that was his right to have it on there. I agree with but, that. And I think if he took it to court, I think uh, I think he'd win. Yes, sir. How long did it take you to start your business? I didn't start my business. I started with a company that had been in business since 1885. And they, uh, my dad gave me some good advice. He said, go to work for a good company, start at the bottom and work your way up. And that's what I did. <laughs> and that was 40 years ago. And it's worked out pretty well. And, and the fun thing is, is we gain in responsibility, we also gain in freedom. And so the company gives me the freedom because they know I'm going to do my job to teach the master's program and take time off from work to do it. To come down here and share with you, to take a day off to do it, and those kinds of things, because they, they know that they can come and be able to get my job done. So that's another dimension of working for a company that also wants to get back to that community. It's part of the great company. Thanks, John. We'll give a talk to looking at the clock.